Acts chapter 3, verse 1. The verse will be on the wall. For those of you watching online, you can follow along on the screen. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. And a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. And when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began to receive all. He began asking to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, let's say it together, look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said to him, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. With a leap, he stood upright and began to walk, and, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping, and what else? Praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they were taking note of him as being one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple and beg alms, and, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. We're uh, just beginning our series, a look at the book of Acts, seeing what it means to be the people of God, uh, living in light of the gospel, living in light of the resurrection, living in light of the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, as, we, as we begin to look at these stories, these stories of miracles, these stories of outreach, these stories of wonders, these stories of men and women just like you and I uh, walking with God, I thought it was important for us to say that the book of Acts was not written, it is not designed to be a guilt trip. When we read the book of Acts, we're not supposed to be like, man, what's wrong with us? We're not supposed to read the book of Acts, and, and as I preach the book of Acts, be like, what's wrong with you people? Don't you have enough faith? The book of Acts is not designed to be a guilt trip. It's not designed to make us see how, fall, how, how short we fall compared to our brothers and sisters of the first century. That's not why it was written. And, and I don't even think that the book, book of Acts was written to be a guidebook either. Now, let me explain what I mean. I, we know it's not designed to be a guilt trip, but I don't think it was designed to be a guidebook either. And what I mean by guidebook is we read this story and we go, okay, step one, pray. Step two, go to the temple. Anybody know where a temple is we could go to? If we find the temple, then step three, find a lame man. Now, you may know a lot of people that are lame, but we're looking for a lame man. And, and then step four, if you find the lame man after you found the temple, after you've gone there in the ninth hour to pray, look at him and say, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and... It's not, it's not written to be this step-by-step -step guide. If we do this, this will happen. No, church, the book of Acts is the biography of the early church. It is the story of regular men and women filled with God's spirit and filled with God's love. I want you to look back at verse 1 of chapter 3 where it says, Peter and John, what's that next phrase? We're going. We're going. Peter and John were going. You see, this story takes place with Peter and John just doing what they were normally going to do. They were going to the temple to pray. They were good Jewish men who were going to the temple at the prescribed hours to pray. And so Peter and John were going to the temple to pray. And so much of the life that we long for as we look at these pages involves you and I doing what we're already doing. Peter and John were going to the temple. You wonder maybe they woke up that morning thinking this, I am a child of God, I am a follower of Jesus Christ, I have accepted God's love for me, so God, before I leave today, where are you at work? Where are you inviting me to join you? Where do I adjust? And John, let's go, we're going to be late, it's almost the ninth hour, right? 
They were going to the temple, just like you and I are going to be doing things today. But I wonder if we could start our day and say, I am a child of God. I am a disciple of Jesus. I have accepted God's love for me. God, where are you at work today? Where are you inviting me to join you? Where do I need to make adjustments? Come on, kids, we're going to Dell's. So much of this story uh, falls in line with what they were already on their way doing. And so this isn't a guidebook, okay, step one, do this step. But it's while we are living our lives as believers, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we go about our way as they did. Last week, Pastor Pam challenged us to begin to envision ourselves in their shoes. One of the most powerful things that she said was this. If you can't see yourself walking over to heal someone, you probably never will. Do you remember she said that? She said, if, if you don't begin to visualize and see in your mind and in your heart that you could walk over and heal someone, guess what? You're probably never going to do that. Doesn't that make a lot of sense? Right? There isn't just this giant leap that happens when you get saved where now you're Peter. And so she said last week, if you can't see yourself walking over to heal that man, you probably never will. And so I'm going to add to that this morning by saying this. If you can't see yourself talking to the man, you're probably never going to heal the man. And if you don't see yourself walking over to talk to the man, you're probably never going to talk to the man, which would then lead you to heal the man. Let's start at the very beginning. Right? It first probably starts for us in our minds, visualizing ourselves walking over where someone else is. You've been vaccinated, right? Can I get this close? <laughs> we first have to see ourselves walking over to someone. Then we have to see ourselves talking to someone. If we're ever going to heal that man, we first have to walk over to that person and talk to that person. And so the first step that we need to begin to see and pray about is can you even see yourself going over to that person to talk to them? I read an article uh, from NBC News recently that talked about a surprisingly high number of people who want to continue wearing masks even though they've been fully vaccinated and even though the numbers in the region in which they live are very low and mask mandates have, uh, have fallen, people want to still wear their masks. You know why? Because then you don't have to see what they look like underneath. They like the fact that they can go into the store and you can't really tell what's going on under the mask. And so they want to keep wearing the mask because they have liked the isolation that has come through the pandemic, right? Some of us, when there was lockdown, we were like, whoa, I've been waiting for this my whole life. <laughs> I'm not going to name any names or look at any. I'm trying really hard not to look at you right now. <laughs> and so while all of us are... Our, we can go outside again. We can take our masks. This is wonderful. Some of us are like, no, <laughs> no, please, I'll do anything. <laughs> Some of you wanted to get COVID to start another outbreak to stay home. I mean, that's probably. So we have to first see ourselves even talking to people if we're going to move into the next step that we read about in the book of Acts. So let's pick up again in the story. Peter and John, they were going and, and, and they saw and had the confidence to just start talking to the person and then were able to be used by God to heal this man. Let's look back at verse 9 to see what happened next. Verse 9. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Who, who are they talking about? Who they saw? The man who used to be lame, right? They saw him walking and praising God. And they, the, the people there, they were taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now, it's clear that this man was well known from that spot. 
This man had been brought to the temple or crawled to the temple every day. It said he was lame from birth and he's there. And so they know that guy. They know this man. And so now when he's walking and leaping and praising God, they are amazed. It says that they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Verse 11. And while he was clinging to Peter and John, all of the people ran together to them at the so-called portico of Solomon, full of what? Full of amazement. Verse 12. Let's watch what our brother Peter does. When Peter saw this, he replied to the people. He replied to the people, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why did you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. But you put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact that we are all witnesses. Verse 16, and on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which had strength in this man whom you see and know. And the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I know that you have acted in ignorance just as your rulers did also. But the things which God has announced beforehand by the mouth of all his prophets that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Therefore, repent. Repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that He may send Jesus, the Christ, appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things which God spoke by the mouth of His holy prophets from ancient time. This is Peter's second sermon in near the temple, and because of this man's healing, it says that a, a crowd ran in their direction. And Peter was able to discern from the amazement and the, the, the wonder that they were wondering what had happened. They knew the lame man, and now they see him, and he's walking and leaping and praising God, and they don't understand how he went from here to there. We see this happen in Jesus' ministry too. The blind man that he healed, right? People are like, wait, we knew he was blind, but now he can see. And they're trying to connect the dots. And so uh, Peter uh, preaches this sermon and he talks to these Jewish, belie these Jewish people in the temple about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of their fathers. He talks about the Messiah, he talks about the promises being fulfilled. He talks about the prophets speaking about these things beforehand. This is a very different atmosphere than you and I going to the Warwick Mall. There is an understanding of Scripture. There is a faith in the God Yahweh of the Old Testament, right? Of God of all creation. But they knew Him as the God of the Old Testament, the, the promises of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, people around us. When they hear Abraham, they think Lincoln. <laughs> right? This is a very different, di different atmosphere. And so if we're going to put ourselves in... Uh, the shoes of Peter and John and put ourselves in the story like we're trying to do to walk with our brothers in this moment, we have to think about what's going on in this record that relates to the moment that we're in today. And so I want to simplify what's happening in this record. The end goal of the miracle that happened for the man who was lame was that he got healed. Tell your neighbor, the lame man got healed. That was the, the blessing and the, the amazing thing that happened for that man's life. But the bigger thing that I believe is the end goal of God in this story is not just that the lame man got healed. The end goal of the miracle, listen here, the end goal of the miracle 
was that a crowd gathered to hear the gospel. Only one person got healed. Now, that was the best day ever. I'm not trying to minimize that. The power of God showed up in this man's life in a transformative way, but the miracle is not the end goal of the story. The message is is the end goal of the story. You will see as you read the book of Acts, miracle after miracle, and watch as we journey through it and as you read it on your own time, that oftentimes the miracle is what draws the crowd together for God's ultimate purpose for them to hear the message. I don't mean to sound crass and callous, but you can be healed and go to hell. The remedy for what ills all of humanity is not physical healing, it's the gospel and forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And so this is great. And he's showing glimpses of what eternity is going to be like where the lame man will leap like the deer, but the end goal of this miracle is for this crowd to gather. The miracle brought the crowd and the crowd heard the message And so don't just focus on the miracle, focus on the message. And so what is the message and how does it relate to us? Well, look again at verse 9. I got this on uh, the screen. Uh, Verse 9 again. The people, the crowd, saw him walking and praising God, and they were taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And while he was clinging to Peter and John, all of the people ran together to them at the so-called portico of Solomon, full of what? Listen to this now. But when Peter saw this, he did what? Peter replied to something. Now, whether or not they were asking an audible question, it was very clear what was being wondered in this moment. What was being wondered? What happened? This man was lame and now he's walking and leaping and praising God and they're coming with wonder and amazement. And so Peter replies to their question. Whether they asked it or it was implied, Peter is responding to the question that they asked because a miracle happened. And the answer to whatever questions they were asking is found in verse 16. Acts 3.16. From the New Living Translation, it says this. Through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed. And you know how crippled he was before. Faith in whose name? Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. So much of what we see in the book of Acts is the disciples just answering the questions that the people ask. How did this happen? And I'm going to give you a little tip. Most often, the answer is Jesus. (laughs) In Bible college, we used to joke that if your professor asked a hard question, you could just say, Jesus, and you'd be right. But as you journey through Acts together, you're going to see that that is actually the answer to the question. How did this happen? Jesus. How did this happen? He was lame before. Well, yeah, it wasn't us. It was his faith in the name of Jesus. And so questions that are asked by the people that the apostles and disciples are with is going to be the launching pad for the message and sometimes the miracle, right? In Acts chapter 2, we read this a couple weeks ago. After the disciples spoke in tongues... They all, the crowd, continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? After Peter preaches his sermon on the day of Pentecost, when the crowd heard this, they were pierced in the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Later in Acts chapter 4, we'll see this probably next week, that when Peter and John and, and the layman, when they get brought before the council, when they had placed them in the center the leaders began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? When Stephen is brought before the high priest, the high priest said, are these things true? 
I, I haven't found yet in any translation or even looking at the original Greek of the book of Acts, the moment where the disciples were just going around with a sign that said, be saved, believe in Jesus, be saved, believe in Jesus, be saved. This isn't working, uh, Nathaniel. What should we do? Let's try bumper stickers. Be saved. <laughs> believe in Jesus. That's not working. Let's get a radio station. That's not what we see in the book of Acts. They're not just going around uh, meeting people and be like, hi, nice to meet you. What's your name? You know, I don't care. Jesus. They're engaging with the people. Sometimes it's one person. Sometimes it's a crowd. And all they're doing is answering the question. People around the disciples are asking, how did this happen? And so church, as we uh, follow in their footsteps today as the generation of God's people, all we have to do is answer that question for people. End of sentence. People in your life and in mine are already asking us those kind of questions. And for us to bring them to the point where they can hear the message of salvation and hear the answer, which is not found in ourselves, but it's found outside of ourselves in Jesus, all we have to do is answer the question, Mona, how are you able to make things work each month in your finances? People ask her that question all the time. I ask her that question all the time. Frank! How did you and your wife in the early years of your marriage, which was so volatile and so much turmoil, get to the place where you are today? I know people have asked him that question. People have come to our church because he has answered that the reason why his marriage got healed was through the power of Jesus. Pam, how are you able to live with such strength after being diagnosed with cancer? Rachel, how did you end up going to India? to care for people in need. Jim, how did you get free from alcohol after decades of addiction? Marie, what happened with your housing situation? I thought you were getting kicked out to be homeless. Larry and Lee, how are you smiling after the year you've had? People are asking you questions that the answer ultimately points them back to God and His Son but I wonder if we hear that that's what's happening. The book of Acts is happening in your cubicle. The book of Acts is happening through Facebook Messenger. The book of Acts is happening on the grocery store line. The book of Acts is happening in the warehouse. The book of Acts is happening in your classroom. It's happening. And especially if people know that you used to be like this. And now you're like this. Your marriage used to be like this, and now it's like this. Your diagnosis used to be like this, and now it's like this. Your attitude used to be like this, but now it's like this. Your anxiety and depression and your emotional health used to be like this, but now it's like this. This situation in your family used to be like this, and now it's like this. Hey, do not believe the lie that Jesus is no longer healing in this time in which we're living. I just listed a bunch of them, and you often are the walking testimony of his deliverance. Sure, maybe you didn't start out like this, but I know there's healing in your life. And as you go from this to this, in the biggest ways and even small ways, people that you're interacting with are going to ask you, how did that happen? What is going on? How did you get to this situation? Why are you like this? People are asking you those questions. All we have to do, just like Peter, is answer the question. Suddenly, I feel a, a weight lifted for me to figure out every apologetic and answer to every single question about every other world religion and the Crusades and all the other things that people are like, well, what about? They're not asking me those questions. They're asking me, you used to be like this, now you're like this. What happened to you? And you know what? I know the answer. The answer is that by the name of Jesus, this man was made well. That's all we have to do. That's all Peter did. He answered their question. So the miracle 
of the lame man and in your life is not the end goal. The miracle is just to draw the crowd so they can hear the message. That's what they did in the book of Acts. Yeah, it sounded different and they said the word Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But ultimately, Peter was just answering their question because they saw the power of God and he told them what it was all about. And so, as we read the book of Acts, I don't want us to just say, man, I really want to do a miracle. Man, I want to see signs, miracle, miracles, and wonders in our day. I do too. But I think a better thing to ask and pray as we open up the Scriptures is, Father, I want to be led by Your Spirit. And begin to visualize and think about us going across the street to talk to our neighbor, who we may find out in a couple weeks actually is sick and needs prayer and can see the power of God in that situation. But if we don't first see ourselves even going to someone to talk, we're certainly not going to get to the point where we can go and see us heal them. So uh, here in the book of Acts, we see spirit-filled, loved people living their lives with God and stepping into the opportunities that come. And I I just want to close by reading chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, to see what happened. Verse 1, as Peter and John are speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them being greatly disturbed because they were teaching people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid their hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. So this is how the story ends. Peter and John get put in jail. I mean, that didn't turn out the way they had hoped. Miracle, message, prison. (laughs) But this was not a bad day because look at the next verse. But, but many of those who had heard the message did what? Believed. Believed. They're not even talking about the lame man being healed. What is recorded in Scripture is, yes, they got put in prison, but look what happened. Many of those who heard the message believed, and the number of men came to be about what? 5,000. 5,000. So even though they ended their night in shackles, 5,000 people believed. 5,000 people got saved because a miracle set the domino effect for them to hear the message. And Peter had seen himself walking in the steps of Jesus to say, I know the answer to that question. And so now here we find ourselves following Peter who followed Jesus, seeing God work in your lives and in the lives of the people around you all over the world in miraculous ways. Holy Spirit ways to bring attention to the crowds around us, whether it's 5,000 or just like someone, to say, I know the answer to that question. The answer is Jesus Christ. This happened because God has bestowed upon His Son the name above every name. And that's all we have to do. Step into that moment and give the answer to life's most persistent question. It's Jesus. So Lord, uh, as easy as this seems to make sense in my head, I pray that you would continue to help us to back down that fear and just be filled with your love. As, As Pam taught last week, God, let us accept your great love for us so we can be free from fear. Help us to see what's going on around us, to listen to what's going on around us. And God, may we be led by your spirit today. May we give answers to the questions being asked so that you may receive glory, so that people can be healed and ultimately through the message of salvation be saved and have a relationship with you. Oh God, we give you thanks and praise today. Through the name above all names, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen.